Hello, it's the first week of October here in Brisbane. My name is Ben Steele. And my name is Brooke Carson, and this is Real World News. Here are your headlines. There has been another shock in New South Wales politics today after Deputy Premier and National Leaders John Barillaro announced his resignation. His departure follows the sudden resignation of former Premier Gladys Berejiklian when she became the centre of the corruption investigation launched on Monday. In global financial news, a team of investigative journalists say a number of high-profile politicians and celebrities have been hiding their wealth in banks around the globe. Portions of that report, which we know as the Pandora Papers, have been leaked, but the full report is due out any day now. In COVID news, Australia is due to hit a vaccination milestone this week, with just 85,000 more jabs needed before 80% of eligible Australians have at least their first dose. Almost 4 million people have received jabs in the past fortnight. In related news, QUT professor Lydia Moroska has been named one of the world's 100 most influential people by Time magazine. Fairly early on, Professor Moroska's research revealed that COVID-19 was being transmitted as an airborne virus. Also from QUT, painter William Robinson has a new exhibition underway in Gardens Point. The body of work is called Nocturne and explores his vision of the night sky. The show is currently underway at William Robinson Gallery in Old Government House. A big weekend in sport for the Penrith Panthers who claim the 2021 NRL Premiership Trophy with a 14-12 win over the South Sydney Rabbitohs. It is the third Premiership for the Sydney club and their first since their win in 2003. Penrith playmaker Nathan Cleary was awarded the Clive Churchill Medal while his father Ivan Cleary won his first Premiership as Penrith coach. Those are your headlines. Checking the markets now, here is our Wall Street report. Yesterday was a tough day on Wall Street. The S&P 500 has had its worst day of trading since May and finished by sliding 75 points. This is partly out of fear of a potential crash in China's real estate market. All eyes are focused on Evergrande, one of China's largest real estate developers, who are yet to find out if the government will bail them out with creditors. This has commentators asking if this is China's Lehman Brothers moment, echoing the 2008 GFC. And Australia's largest pipeline owner, APA, has made a non-binding proposal to acquire Ausnet, an Australian energy company. The proposal offers $2.6 a share and trumps Brookfield's offer by 10 cents. APA Chief Executive Rob Wills says the takeover presents an opportunity to provide an Australian-controlled combined group listing on the ASX. Finally, overnight, Victoria's construction industry is facing a two-week shutdown at a cost of billions of dollars per week. The shutdown was triggered by a violent protest against a government mandate requiring all construction workers to have at least one dose of COVID-19 vaccine by the 23rd of September. An angry crowd of 500 protesters gathered outside CFE, CFMEU headquarters in Melbourne, throwing a crate and bottles at Construction Secretary John Setka. Checking the markets, the Dow Jones closed down by 614 points, the Nasdaq closed down by 330 points, and the ASX 200 is currently trading down by 54 points. That's us minding your business. I'm Paige Van Luntren. See you next time. After a weekend of heavy rains, we must remember that this is storm season. Here's a look at your weather. Morning Brisbane. Let's get started with the national weather today. Up north in Darwin, it'll be sunny with some, check, with some clouds at 36 degrees. Cairns will have a late th thunderstorm with 31 degrees. Back home in Brisbane, it'll be sunny and 23 degrees. A bit further down south in Sydney, they can expect some drizzle and 17 degrees. Canberra and Melbourne will both be very cold with a chance of snow at 6. Hobart, even colder. Lots of snow and 5 degrees. Adelaide with a bit of morning drizzle but clear off in the afternoon to 14 degrees. Perth will be warm at 25. And the red centre at Alice will be sunny and hot at 35 degrees. Closer to home, the Sunshine Coast can expect a party cloudy day with 27 degrees. Brisbane, a sunny day at 28. And the Goldie may get a storm later this afternoon with a temperature of 26. The outlook for Brisbane this weekend, it'll be cloudy on Friday, a possible storm on Saturday, clearing to another glorious and sunny day on Sunday. Back to you. 
The COVID-19 pandemic forced Brisbane's Greater Public Schools Association to shorten its rugby season. The finals just recently finished. Thomas Brandt has this report. The final round of the Greater Public Schools First 15 Rugby Competition took place over the weekend, with St Joseph's Nudgee College claiming their 43rd GPS Premiership. COVID restrictions meant each school only played five games, as opposed to the eight that would be scheduled in a regular season. The final round of action saw Nudgee defeat Ipswich Grammar School 17 points to 13 on their home turf. The victory was Nudgee's fifth of the season and was enough to keep them three points clear of Anglican Church Grammar School who finished in second place on the competition ladder. The final round also saw a number of other close games. Brisbane State High School travelled up the range to take on Toowoomba Grammar School but were defeated 21 points to 19. The Southport School finished their season with a strong away win, defeating St Joseph's Gregory Terrace 29 points to 12 at Tennyson. In the final match of the round, Anglican Church Grammar School put up a strong performance to defeat Brisbane Grammar School 34 points to 10 at Northgate. That's our GPS Rugby wrap up, back to you. When the internet was launched, experts thought it would level the playing field for everyone. But for some, the expense of going online has made cyberspace just a little beyond their grasp. Our own Almira Azam speaks with QT Associate researcher Kim Osman about the digital divide. Now to start off, you're taking on quite a large topic as technology plays a part in almost everyone's everyday lives in this decade. However, your research focuses on low-income families. Can you tell us a bit about your research and why you've chosen this specific demographic? Absolutely. So I think the key lies in that first phrase that you just used, that technology is a part of people's everyday lives. Uh, and what we know is that for low income families, this isn't the case. A lot of families really struggle to access and use technology. Uh, and this is an issue that we knew existed before COVID. Um, but we've obviously seen um, when children are trying to learn at home, um, as families are working from home, that this is an issue that is just becoming increasingly important, that children in low income families have access to technology and devices uh, and also the support to be able to use them properly. Yeah, of course. Um, and you did mention that since the COVID-19 pandemic began, it's gotten a lot worse. Can you tell me how your research has informed that so far? And just how important it is for these families to gain access to that technology. Absolutely. So a lot of low income families will rely on schools. So children will go to school and they'll use computers or devices that are at school. Um, but when families are in lockdown, that connection is broken. So for a lot of low income families who are already um, you know, part of a very large educational divide, um, then fall further behind their peers. Uh, and this around Australia um, varies quite a bit among states. So we know in Queensland uh, that they have a connection speed in schools at around um, 25 kilobits per student, which is 200 times lower than the rate that students in New South Wales access. Uh, and additionally in Queensland, there's been no policy responses for low income families, um, for students learning at home. So what's happening is that charities are having to step in and fill the gap by providing devices, but they can't always meet the demands of low income families. Um, so do you think that it would be beneficial to get more government support to take some of the pressure off those charities? Absolutely. Uh, so the federal government released their digital economy strategy and there wasn't a huge amount about digital inclusion in this. So we'd like to see a little bit more. And we'd really like to see a coordinated policy response from the federal government that you know, looks at the needs of low income families. Uh, we'd also like to see a response from industry as well. So perhaps the telcos making available um, a low income or no cost broadband product for these families so that they can connect at home. And that's also given the fact that I'm assuming that their access to the technology required, such as the devices like iPads, laptops, that is hard enough on top of their lack of access to the internet. Oh, absolutely. So, you know, finding one device in a family that might be shared among three or four children, parents then have to make decisions about, you know, who's using that device, for how long, um, parents are making decisions if they do have data about how that data is shared as well. Uh, and one of the other issues that we're finding is that, you know, you can provide a device and you can provide data but students also need to have the skills to be able to use these. They need support at home to be able to complete their homework, complete their schoolwork. Well, thank you so much for your time today. I've really appreciated it. I know that I've learnt a lot today, mm. so I hope that our audience will too. 
Um, and we would love to see where your research takes you in the future. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Almira. That's all for Real World News. I'm Almira Zam. See you next time. In the age of COVID, the social distancing rules vary from venue to venue. Ella Holding McGrath has this report. Play fair. These are the words being echoed across the state by the live music industry. Their calls to action come after strict regulations have been eased for sporting venues, while the entertainment industry still faces comparatively harsh restrictions, which are stunting revenue and employment. Currently, sporting events are operating with 100% capacity and little enforced social distancing. Yet, in a move that has confused many, the state government refuses to apply similar loosened COVID restrictions to live music venues. Currently under the restrictions that are in place by the, the Queensland government and the chief health officer, we're, we're about 30% capacity. Uh, we're operating in that one person, two square metre rule. The Palaszczuk government has come under fire for these differing restrictions with outcry for a scientific explanation ringing loud. I don't think the government uh, understands entirely what it's doing when it comes to its response to the pandemic. The Premier relies on the so-called health advice. If there is health advice that somehow discriminates against the entertainment industry, provide it to us so that you can substantiate these decisions. But respiratory and virology experts say there is a legitimate difference between sporting and music events when considering the spread of the virus. And that difference is singing. There's definitely a uh, work out there that says that more forced breath, like with singing, pushes loads more virus out. If you have COVID-19, you're infected with the virus. In a state that's seen such small numbers of cases for consecutive months, however, this explanation isn't enough for the outraged community. And if no changes are made, the live music industry confronts closure of venues and the loss of thousands of jobs. This daunting reality has given rise to a main player in the fight to ease restrictions, the Playfair petition. It's described as a life or death last chance to support Queensland's music industry. Just an overview of the Playfair petition is that we, we don't see the consistency in having 50,000 people at Suncorp Stadium. Uh, you don't get dropped in by a drone to your seat. You mingle through bars, you mingle through everything. So we think there's inconsistency there. So you know, if it's if it's a risk, what you wouldn't do, you wouldn't do Suncorp. Some suggest Queensland should adopt other states' approaches, and industry workers are keen to implement changes that can ensure the safety of patrons while still allowing for larger capacities. However, while the state government remains largely silent regarding the issue, the future of the live music industry remains unsure. That's the news here in Brisbane. My name is Ben Steele. And my name is Brooke Carson, and this is Real World News. See you next time. Mm -hmm.